Hi. Welcome to the Center for Global Development. I'm Amanda Glassman. I'm the Director for Global Health Policy here. Um, I'm really pleased to host the AMR review today at the Center for Global Development um, because we've long been interested in developing better policy on global public goods like reduced drug resistance with a particular role uh, focus on the role of international agencies and multilateral development banks. Um, the AMR review has received an incredible amount of interest, and I think that is just a testimony to the incredible work that you and your team have done. So Laura Jim O'Neill will, will present the results of that report, and then we'll have a panel where I'll be joined also by Jim Kerr and my colleague Rajesh Merchandani, who's the Vice President of Communications, will facilitate our discussion. I think on this issue, there continues to be the impression that AMR, antimicrobial resistance, is mainly a problem in high-income countries. But in fact, it is what low- and middle-income countries do that will make the difference for the effectiveness of micro antimicrobials going forward. And that difference will be for all of us. And the scale of the AMR management challenge is just a different order of magnitude in countries like China and India than when we think of the UK and the US. There's just a huge informal sector. There's just, you know, it's, it's very, very different order uh, scale. And I think the AMR secretariat at WHO uh, spoke at a meeting at the World Bank recently, and I want to mention what they called a reality check. In parts of the developing world, there is no medical microbiology lab in main hospitals. There is no infection prevention and control. There is no drug uh, regulation. It's mostly over the counter. It's mostly direct purchasing. There is little knowledge and awareness. There is not a functioning primary health care program. Now, this isn't universal, but it's certainly a huge issue. And there are also many competing demands for very scarce public funding in health. So a colleague pointed out to me, we really do know what should be done, and I think the AMR review puts that all together very well. But we persist in not doing it, or in not supporting countries effectively in getting it done. The vision is there with the AMR review, and today, in fact, President Obama and Prime Minister Modi agreed to deepen cooperation on global health security and on AMR, including multi-drug resistant TB, and that's great news. But the money and the mechanisms at the international level are still inadequate. Uh, Jim was mentioning to me before we came in that most countries have developed national action plans uh, to deal with AMR, but most are not yet funded. Now, part of that's just because those are new, but part of it's because we haven't set up the mechanisms to provide the right kind of support, not necessarily from the outside, but also within those countries. The AMR review recommendations are being presented and discussed all over the world. And perhaps the recommendation that has gotten most attention is that related to incentives for the development of new antibiotics and diagnostics on the push side. But in Lord O'Neill's visit to CGD today, we'd like to focus on two major pieces of the puzzle that have gotten less attention. First, how can aid agencies, multilateral development banks, and other ins international institutions help with the money and the mechanisms in low and middle income countries? Is the G20 the answer? Will the UN statement provide the way? I mean, should there be AMR programs at bilateral aid agencies, not just the occasional ad hoc project? And second, how much attention has been given to the pull mechanisms for new antibiotics and diagnostics? How can we get to affordable price points that will make access uh, feasible on the case of diagnostics, but also doesn't create perverse incentives for overuse. So with that, I'll turn the podium over to Lord O'Neill to talk about the report, and we'll join him later. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Amanda, uh, for that uh, interesting introduction and challenging uh, introduction to follow. Uh, and thank you to uh, all of you for being here and, of course, for uh, CGD to invite us to share some time with you. Um, I, uh, first of all, want to apologize that I am not going to have more than 15 minutes, so I'm not going to do justice to the breadth or depth of everything that we have to say. Uh, and I'm actually going to ignore some of the uh, questions that Amanda said until it comes to the discussion afterwards, because 
and I work, then it will uh, take up even more time of other things I, I think I need to, to highlight. Um, it has been a, a remarkably uh, stimulating path for myself and the team. Uh, I think everybody here probably is aware. If not, you will be now. Uh, I have no science or health background. Uh, just over two years ago, I didn't even know really what antimicrobial resistance was myself. Some people might say, I still don't. Um, but uh, we have approached this whole thing in terms of uh, an economic and financial uh, issue, and that's why I was asked to lead it, and that's how uh, we've approached uh, our, our final stage. And I'm going to give you a flavor uh, of, of what's, uh, what we've come up with. Um, so uh, in that light, um, going back right to the start, uh, some of you, are, I'm sure, are familiar with these, but it's important to emphasize when it comes, actually, despite what I've just said, to aspects of what Amanda has said. Um, we showed right at the start, and we're very pleased that it's sort of become a number that gets touted all over the world. If we don't do something about this uh, in another 35 years, 2050, uh, I deliberately highlighted that year because of linked to the lower income world. What I am sort of strangely famous for is this thing called bricks on my forehead. Uh, and if we don't do something about it, there's going to be 10 million people a year uh, dying in another 35 years' time. As uh, Haller and Will, who are around somewhere here, two of my uh, wonderful colleagues, uh, and the rest of the team cleverly persuaded me that in the 21 months that our review has existed, a million people will have died of AMR, way more than a lot of the pandemics that we're all so rightly similarly scared about. Uh, and actually, by 2050, that would mean three, uh, sorry, somebody dying every three seconds. Of those 10 million deaths, one third of them, uh, or close to it, would be in TB alone. And the rise of drug resistant TB is an enormously worrying thing that needs urgent uh, attention. So, all of that, uh, what Amanda said, is so true. And uh, again, linked to why I was asked to do it, the dream uh, which made the BRICS thing so uh, popular that the collective economies of those uh, large emerging populated economies could be being bigger than the collective size of the G7, it is not going to happen. Uh, the 10 million deaths, more than uh, a million of those alone could be in each of China uh, and India, and it could if there's not enough things that could devastate Africa, uh, this certainly would do. Uh, very importantly, and actually, again, I'm linking it to what Amanda said, um, we have also shown, and the other big number that we like to get a lot of focus on, the accumulated lost global outputs over the next 35 years, so between now and then, uh, we estimate is a staggering 100 trillion, 100 trillion dollars. World economy today, somewhere between 70 and 80 trillion. Left to its own devices, the world, you wouldn't think this from the gloomy stuff we all read every hour, but we don't always struggle. But left to its own devices over the next 35 years, the world economy could treble. But if we don't do something about this, it will lose 100 trillion. Um, as uh, a very smart and sharp friend of mine from the old world I used to live in of investment management pointed out to me, all the interventions that we recommend in, where have we got? I've just written, we must have copies of our publication around, I hope, uh, along 10 themes, 29 specific recommendations. If all of them were implemented, it would cost, in our opinion, about $40 billion. As this very smart friend of mine pointed out, that translates into a percentage of re return of about two and a half thousand percent, uh, which he also jokingly added, a lot of hedge funds would give a lot to get that kind of return these days. Um, these are the 10 different areas of the multi-dimensional complex problem uh, that we decided then to focus on. 
Uh, we have published six separate papers on, on some of these 10 themes because we uh, believe they were so crucial for us to study. And frankly, part of the way of trying to uh, uh, create more awareness about the issue than there has been. And I'm just going to spend the last few minutes of quickly going through them rather than the rest of my show. So the first one, and, and, and like, like one of the big four, uh, we think there's a need for a global public awareness campaign. And again, multinational institutions might be able to play a role in that. Amongst the things we are here in the US for is to help sow the seeds for a high-level UN agreement in September. And I believe that the global awareness campaign should be owned by the UN. Um, and it needs to be multidimensional uh, and diversified, reflective of different cultures and different income groups, uh, and thinking specifically of how you get this over to people in Africa and in China and India and so on. Uh, and a, a, a very important part of this, and I could bore you endlessly about the lack of awareness of AMR, even in the, in the developed, so-called developed world. Uh, going down, uh, number two, sensitive topic in the United States, I think. Uh, we need to do something dramatically in agriculture. We have specifically recommended that from 2018 onwards, a 10-year phased uh, reduction to set targets all over the world, including in the emerging world. Uh, they are going to need help from somebody, uh, and again, the institutions that you made reference to are almost definitely uh, going to, if this gets agreed, or some part of this as a principle gets agreed, they are going to have to play a role. Because understandably in the emerging world, there would be, when they hear this and think, hang on a second, how on earth do we adjust to that without it being very costly for our food security and expensive for us to adjust to? Somebody's got to help them. but. We need to do it. It's the famous Callistin story in China that probably, amongst other things, scared the hell out of me, and I don't know about the science, but people I've learned from it, I think that's a big worrying development, and we need to do something about those kind of things. Uh, linked to all of that, surveillance systems. Uh, somebody once said to us, uh, or me, in a previous uh, engagement I was involved in, the best reviews are ones where policymakers are trying to do a lot of what you're going to say before you've finished. Uh, very proud of the fact that uh, through DFID the, uh, and the Department of Health in particular, the British government already launched uh, uh, a surveillance fund, so-called Fleming Fund, £265 million, that will go through DFID to low-income or DFID beneficiary countries. A lot more needs to be done on that. Human capital. Uh, amazingly, uh, or not amazingly, given the economics of it, we do not have many people that study AMR, and those that do don't get paid very much, and we need to change that. And actually, at the margin, I smell some of that starting to change, but that also includes uh, getting a lot more research people in, these in the low-income countries. Uh, fifthly, Directly following on from that, an early recommendation of ours is a, a need for a global innovation fund. We specifically recommended a uh, $2 billion fund over five years. Uh, another initiative that's already got some take-up of ours, particularly <laughs> delighted that following President Xi's visit to the UK as part of the, the new golden era, uh, the UK and China jointly announced uh, a commitment of £50 million to that Global Innovation Fund. Uh, we uh, are eager for others to join, including philanthropists. Uh, very important part for kicking uh, or kick-starting a lot more uh, academic uh, uh, thinking and approaches to this challenge. Uh, sanitation and hygiene. Um, not something we uh, are recommending as an additional thing, but as we think about low-income countries, uh, I automatically think of India uh, in particular uh, on this issue. Uh, this is all happening at a time where it's very encouraging to hear what Amanda said about President Obama and Prime Minister Modi. By the way, Prime Minister Modi gave us a very supportive quote for our final paper, which was a really nice thing to see. This should be considered in, in, in India, for those of you that are close to India or maybe Indian uh, of origin or from India, 
not, oh my God, yet another thing we have to do, but right in the middle of the Clean, clean India campaign, because if India gives the right attention and it gets the right support to do all of that, then the AMR challenge for India will be more manageable than it otherwise would be. Uh, vaccines and alternatives. Uh, again, actually, we've been influenced by some of the uh, rather, or the few, unfortunately, successful things that have taken place in the low-income world, and uh, particularly the work of Gavi in this regard. Uh, we think the scope for greater use for vaccines, particularly in agriculture, one way uh, for many countries to achieve dramatically lower target usage uh, of antibiotics is to simply replace them uh, with vaccines. It, it astonishes us as a review team that not more uh, idea generation has taken place on that before. One can easily think of a set of incentives which again involve uh, the obvious multinational agencies that would support uh, the promotion of vaccines at the expense uh, of antibiotics. Uh, number eight, uh, Google for doctors. Uh, I don't like to uh, really say that any one intervention of these 10 is more important than the others, but right up there is state-of-the-art diagnostics. Uh, we live in a world where these ridiculous mobile phones, mine of which are being charged in the, air in the other room for at least the third time today, completely dominate our lives, yet our medical practitioners still guess whether we need one of these damn things or not. Uh, I think there's been some important research published again here in the US, even for a country as developed and as sophisticated as this, somewhere between one to two thirds of the antibiotics prescribed are probably not necessary. If we had a state-of-the-art diagnostic tool, then we wouldn't be able to pester our doctors to do it in the way we treat these things like sweets. And that's in the United States. Can you imagine what it's like in the emerging world? So a beneficiary of the market entry type reward we suggest should be for the appropriate diagnostics developers in the emerging world, for something like TB in particular right now. Uh, and then of course we need new drugs. I'm not gonna say any more about that because actually Amanda said let's not talk about that anymore, but very happy to talk about that if people want to. Of course we need more drugs and um, as Amanda highlighted the media's enjoyed discussing some of our recommendations on this topic and then lastly uh, bringing it all together we need to have international action uh, and another reason why we're here in the States uh, is to encourage this bilateral track that we've talked about a lot we believe the G20 is the right place uh, for a solution about new drugs and how to get the money. That is where most of the patented uh, drug producers are, if not all of them. Uh, and so thinking about the right incentives and how to raise the money should be the responsibility of uh, the G20 nations of the world, not least because it includes the biggest uh, emerging economies these days. One of the few good things to have come out of the global crisis in 08, that we have a, a little bit more legitimate global governance than we had before. And then in parallel with that, as I've touched on, we need a, a high-level uh, United Nations agreement on a number of other aspects, including surveillance, uh, compliance, um, accountability, uh, global awareness, and agricultural sensible behavior. And if everybody does that, then I can go back to my day job and keep quiet. Thank you very much. Thanks very much, Lord O'Neill. So I'm going to invite the other panellists up to the stage, and then I'll moderate a discussion with amongst the panellists, uh, and then we'll open it up to questions from the audience. Uh, so let me introduce you. You've met Lord Jim O'Neill. You've met Amanda Glassman. We also have Lawrence Kerr, who is Director of Pandemics and Emerging Threats at the Office of Global Affairs at the US Department of Health and Human Services. Panellists, welcome. Lovely to see you all. Um, let's start with you, Lord O'Neill, um, and particularly ideas to reduce demand. Let's start there. Um, how specifically do you envisage creating incentives for people to reduce their use of antibiotics? As you say, you know, in this country, we think of it as candy. In the UK, we think of it as sweets. And in, you know, in the emerging world as well, yeah. you can buy them over the, account, the counter very, very easily. How do you reduce demand? So I think in the developed world, I, 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 don't, I wasn't as 
specific as what we're, we're we've actually recommended by 2020, so less than four years, it should become mandatory in every developed country to introduce into law no antibiotic without uh, state-of-the-art diagnostic. A lot of people say, can't do that because we don't have the diagnostics and they're not affordable. Uh, and we debated it at considerable, probably debated more about that specific recommendation than any other. Uh, and the reason why we went for that is to get the right uh, focus amongst diagnostic and technology innovators, you need to give them some belief that it's a serious pursuit. Uh, and that, in my opinion, would be an enormously effective way of very quickly reducing the inappropriate use of antibiotics in the developed world. As I think I said, uh, we believe the uh, market entry reward type mechanism we're proposing should also apply to uh, diagnostic developers in the emerging world in particular uh, as to how you get the right focus and maybe some version of advanced market commitment uh, as it relates to that. Uh, and you think about it in a TB sense, mm. why, why, would, why would you not do that? <coughs> advanced market commitments, as many of you all know, incubated at the Centre for Global Development there you right go. here. Just have to drop yes. that in. These guys didn't pay me to say that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Lawrence Kerr, uh, how will the US help low and middle income countries to reduce their antibiotic use and demand for antibiotics? It's a great question and one that we are looking at not only what we are doing domestically, but how we are supporting overall our outreach efforts and what we fund in programs, for example, through the Global Health Security Agenda efforts and the action package on AMR. The, one of the highlights and praise to Lord O'Neill and his team for putting number one recommendation, educational campaign and awareness because the one thing that we find that actually may have the most significant impact with respect to usage is knowledge. And it's across the board knowledge from you know, the mom or dad that goes in with their sick child and is worried and they want something immediately that will help them to recognize that an antibiotic isn't always the answer. And in fact, the vast majority of the time, it probably isn't the answer. But you're also targeting then the healthcare providers, the physicians, the PAs, the nurses. In many countries, particularly low and middle income, the midwives, the pharmacists, that for the treatment of a bacterial agent, you need to do it appropriately. And that's the key, is that when it goes back to the giving the healthcare providers the diagnostic tools that they need in order to make that decision, and to show that mom or dad, your child does not have a bacterial infection. This will actually, could potentially do more harm than good. All of that is part of the equation that we are using whenever we are doing our outreach and education efforts, whether they are domestically through you know, CDC's Get Smart program, or whether we're joining in internationally to the World Antibiotic Awareness Week. All of it's messaging trying to alert people to both the benefits and the dangers of antibiotics. But how do you have to think differently uh, uh, about US audiences and developing world audiences? Mm -hmm. So, you know, what we find is at least domestically is that it is often in our healthcare systems that very um, rush judgment to say that an antibiotic is the first choice. And that we do think of it as needing to provide both the users of antibiotics with more awareness. And let me just give you an example of a study that was done um, in California where simply by putting up a sheet of paper at eight and a half by 11 in pedi pediatric offices and in uh, outpatient clinics, that said, do you need this antibiotic? It reduced overall antibiotic usage by 30%. So you know, this is where we are begging the socio-behavioral sciences to help us understand what actually drives the users of antibiotics and the prescribers of antibiotics to make the decisions that they do to change those towards better prescribing. In lower and middle income countries, you often have the instance where the diagnostics aren't even available. One thing we didn't talk about is that a lot of time, a lot, 
sometimes in the United States and in developed nations, the diagnostic tools actually are available to make those decisions and they're simply not used. And a lot of times it's a choice of speed in which you're trying to get a person through the office. Mm -hmm. In lower and middle income, in middle income countries, those diagnostic tools are often not available. So you're trying to increase the overall awareness, but then it also becomes a question of access. Can you actually get the correct antibiotic for the correct dosage into an individual that actually needs that for treatment of a bacterial infection? Is it is a, I'm listening to this? Uh, is a goal for CGD? You, why not hook up with uh, WeChat? Is the, the the Chinese version of uh, WhatsApp? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I think I just read that they're they're making a major campaign to go into Africa. Mm -hmm. you, you could think of a of, of an app mm -hmm. that had a, educational designs on that. You know, so get ten cent. Get these guys come in here, have a little session, and then off you go. There is an app for that. <laughs> well, just. Um, you know, I'm thinking of the work, there's a colleague at the World Bank, his name is Jishnu Das, and he looks at quality. He uses a, a, a mystery client approach to figure out what's really happening in public and private sector clinics. And, uh, you know, in, in urban India, people are using medical services all the time of different kinds, and providers have different qualifications. But what you see happening when it comes to prescribe, when they send these mystery clients in is, there's no diagnosis going on, other, or at least not using a diagnostic tool. And then you see the guy kind of grinding up you know, a couple different uh, pills and prescribing of which some could be antibiotics. And you know, so there's a lot of variation in practice. Of course, India is also home to some of the best healthcare in the world for the better off. But for most people, they're going in the private sector, they're going to over the counter, they're being, you know, they're, they're taking some antibiotics, but probably not the whole. Uh, can of worms. So there's a lot of challenges, I think. And Amanda, I know you have particular uh, thoughts about the challenges involved in global awareness campaigns. Well, maybe I could talk about the World Bank. What do you think? Let's come on to that in one second. Talk about global awareness campaigns. You can't escape it. <laughs> well, I worry about the global awareness campaign, I have to tell you, because you know we're all familiar with the typical public health approach, which is to put up the poster in the clinic that says, please, you know, which it's great that information really does affect behavior, and we need to evaluate in every single context. But so many times in public health programs in many parts of the world, you see, you know, the sign "Eat more fruits and vegetables." That's this month's, you know, day. There's World Toothpaste Day. I mean, e every day seems to have a different kind of pro-health message. So, I'm, I'm also worried about uh, targeting our messages to the particular context and health systems in which they're operating. Mm -hmm. So I guess that's just a, a worry. I, I agree with you that there's a need to reach scale and to reach as many people as possible, but if we really want to change behavior, is that is information enough? So I, I'd, I'd think about it slightly differently, and again, it's partly because you know, I'm not a health person, and I think when, when I look at uh, the most effective campaigns that I'm aware of, it, it, it's, it's got to be broader than thinking of it just as a health issue. You've got to do it as something that's cool and trendy. Mm -hmm. So a, 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 a kind of distant analogy, quite distant, is uh, how many of you are familiar with Teach for America? This thing that, so that I've, I've been very involved in the development of the British version of that, Teach First, and I was on the board of, for my current life, I was on the board of Global Teach for All, which is mm -hmm. taken off in all sorts of low-income countries all over the place. And one of the reasons you get a lot of people wanting to do it, because they think it's cool and trendy. Uh, so what the way to do it is, mm. to, is to not focus on some kind of yet another health thing. Is to like, this is cool and trendy. Mm. This this is going to make you be part of the kind of cool, cool cat the class. Cool kids. That, that, that's that's the way you got to do these things. But the problem is, and this is where we get to the international institutions, Amanda. Hold on, uh, is that health systems, cultures in different countries are so vastly different. How then do you build the kind of international coalition that you talk about in your recommendations? How does that even stick together and how does it work and what are the roles for different international actors? So let's start with you and then let's get to Matt. So I, I've just fresh from, it's quite, quite a relief to come down to DC from having two days of UN talk, which is, you know, sort of hard, hard for somebody from my background to sort of completely, un, under, well, not completely, <laughs> to begin to understand. <laughs> Um, I thought it's not straightforward, uh, and we, we've spent a lot of time the past two days 
talking with uh, the, the Mexican facilitator that's going to be the person at the front of the, the UN high-level deal we're hoping that will happen. Uh, and I, I've ended the two days, I don't know, it's kind of just been beaten down, but I, you know, I think one has to trust those that understand the events, uh, the other past challenges that have come through things like a UN deal, and there's quite a few that have been affected, I think. Uh, HIV, yeah. um, for example, mm -hmm. that, that you've got to trust their experience of how the best way to get it through the system is. So <coughs> I think on the principles of what's needed is, is probably the right approach at the start. Because if you get into too much detail, and you, especially if you start scaring emerging countries off, that's the last thing you want to do. But uh, I, I leave it to the experts. I thought you were an expert. Okay. <laughs> so, what is I the role for inter other okay. international institutions so, then? Uh, okay, so I wanted to talk a little bit about the role of the World Bank and the multilateral mm -hmm. development banks because, in a way, they're very well suited to do work in this area. They're, they're good at fundraising, uh, they're good at sort of knowledge and data management, and they're good at operational yeah. support in low and middle income countries. And really importantly, they're intersectoral. Yep. So they're working That's in really health thing and in ag and uh, livestock ministry and, uh, you know, they're working across the sectors, finance ministry. So those are all attributes I think that would be really desirable for working on AMR. But there is the issue that the World Bank does not currently have a mandate to work on global public goods like the battle for AMR because their primary vehicle is demand-based lending and grants to governments that are generally speaking based on government priorities. Now, if government priorities include AMR, that's one really great solution. Um, but there are lots of competing priorities, as I mentioned. And um, you know, the fact is that sustained action against antibiotic resistance necessarily involves multiple countries moving ahead on their plans as quickly as possible. So I think that a World Bank mandate and a window of funding for AMR would go a long way to help. And then second, we've talked about information. And we've also talked about incentives. And we've talked about incentives mainly for medicines and for diagnostics. But I think there need to be incentives for moving ahead on tracking the problem and carrying out reforms, not just for governments, but for markets, healthcare markets in low-income countries. So things that the World Bank could do, if you imagine. They do policy-based loans, which are basically setting up conditions of reform against uh, disbursements to country budgets. So imagine that they could do policy-based lending for policy and regulatory reform in three or more sectors, in health and ag, in water and environment. So that's interesting. Another possibility is kind of a pay-for-performance scheme. We love pay-for-performance here at the Center for Global Development. For those of you who come to a lot of our events, I forgive me. Uh, but I think you could reward performance, progress on robust surveillance in labs, building on this new joint evaluation process on surveillance that has been happening under the global health security agenda. Third, there could be incentives for more rational use in markets, healthcare service markets, but I'll save some of that, those ideas, but also incentives for patients to adhere to medication and incentives for providers to, to educate themselves and rationalize use. So the question is whether this could happen, if it's feasible, and whether the AMR review might push a little bit on that, um, or is it really down to the, the people who are sitting on the board of those organizations to think more about that kind of effort? So, very interesting to hear you say, <coughs> excuse me, so the, the formal part of, of our life as a review is, is now over with this publication, <laughs> but uh, between now and September is mm -hmm. really important time, and uh, some of my team, and partly now coincidentally because I happen to be a, a minister in the British Finance Ministry, uh, my, my involvement in it will, will, will continue in some way, at least until uh, these big events in September. Uh, and I say that because I, I know I've been discussing with, with people in the World Bank, and I think many aspects of what you've just said sound very, very appealing to me. I think the World Bank's going to have uh, a voice on this. Uh, they're going to be publishing some things about it. Uh, I think they're going to do it in the build-up to the G20 meeting I, that I touched on earlier. I think uh, for a couple of reasons I say that. We, we have this year a uh, historic moment of China hosting the G20. China is a, sees itself as a champion of the emerging world. 
uh, which is very important. Uh, World Bank has a seat at that table. Uh, they, they had a seat at the G7 table, which, by the way, ha highlighted AMR as an issue, was it two weeks back? Uh, and I think there's some important things. And I have to say, uh, when I think about it in the context of the current challenges of the world economy, for the, for the World Bank to be given greater license in that sense uh, makes an enormous amount of sense to me. If, if, if I, actually, I home in just on China, where we all focus, I mean, obviously, actually, most of the focus is on the challenges they've got, but of course, the other big focus is how rapidly wealthy China is becoming, but they still have tens and tens of millions of people in poverty. And if the World Bank could be encouraged to do things piloting mm -hmm. just in China, yeah or I don't know, or parts mm -hmm. of India, in, which should be seen as helping <coughs> these places reach their potential, uh, the importance of these countries in global trade would have multiplier effects. Mm -hmm. the, and the other reason why I say that, it's only two years since the, the G20 said in, in Brisbane, we need to spend money on public infrastructure to get global GDP up by 2%. Yeah. That seems to me like a pretty low-cost investment way of, of exploring this. Mm -hmm. And so I, I, I am, I'm glad this has come up because uh, it's an important way for trying to encourage World, World Bank and other type. I could imagine IFC could play mm -hmm. some roles a, a, alongside the World yeah. Bank. I see many things like this. Lawrence Kerr, let's talk about the US's role in promoting the global health security agenda. A lot of investments were made in surveillance and monitoring post Ebola. Mm -hmm. What are we learning from those? How could the US and other agencies use that knowledge uh, to improve surveillance of AMR? So what you've seen in the implementation and funding of the uh, priority one countries within the global health security agenda is certain funds have been targeted for surveillance. and. In doing so, they are doing it in a dual-use manner in that as long as they are building systems and lab capacities and training personnel for infectious disease threats, they're doing so also for AMR pathogens of concern. And what they're doing is helping the individual countries, one, do a risk assessment to determine what are the actual pathogens that they do need to be concerned about within their country, and then helping them to build the lab capacities in order to test for those within their country. There are many countries that do not even have those baseline studies to know what's the problem in their country, and then secondly, how to test for it. Those are, tend to be more of the low-income countries. The middle-income countries where you have those capacities in place, the U.S. is funding programs to build those into the surveillance systems that not only link the multi-sectoral aspects so that you would have a human health system talking to a food surveillance system, mm -hmm. talking to an animal surveillance system, that are all then talking about AMR as one community, one health approach, but that those are then talking to the WHO and its GLASS effort, which is the kind of global effort to unite surveillance systems um, that are looking at AMR pathogens and emerging trends within um, antimicrobial resistance. Did you want to come in? So let me just follow up on that then. The, but the, the kind of investment that's going to be needed to make sure that we can ramp up surveillance of AMR across countries. Mm -hmm. I mean, Ebola, yes, a huge problem concentrated in one area. We're talking mm -hmm. about the entire developing world. Mm -hmm. Aid is not going to pay for that. So how are we going to build that? What, where, what is the role for other sources of finance? Who else is going to back that up? Maybe the international institutions again. What are, the, what are your thoughts on that? So one of the things that the WHO has initiated in the changeover of their IHR process in GHSA, remember, overall, its ultimate goal was to enhance international health regulation uh, compliance. And so as part of the IHR reform and the institutionalization of the joint external evaluation is this process where individual countries undergo a self-assessment and to look across 19 different criteria of which AMR is just one of them and to say, do we have the capabilities in place and where are we on a scale of basically one to five? When a country does this, and I'll give you an example, I was fortunate enough to be on the external evaluation for Ethiopia. Ethiopia did its own evaluation of a self-assessment that brought in external advisors to look at that and say, what do you think of this? It turned over the report ultimately to the Minister of Health and the Ministry of Livestock and Fisheries, and they ultimately brought that to the Prime Minister. 
there are a whole set of recommendations <coughs> across the 19 action areas where the government said, okay, we can handle these, we're gonna fund this portion. There are a set of outstanding capabilities and capacity building measures where then other countries and the donor countries come in and say, oh, we're able to help with this, this, and this. And then when you turn those, all of these are publicly accessible reports, you then turn to the donor community, so for example, the private sector roundtable of the global health security agenda, that then looks at those gaps and says, we can help fill this niche as well. So it's this matchmaking process that goes on with the gaps, trying to fill them over time, and then in a couple of years, you go back and do an assessment to see whether or not those gaps have been filled. But ultimately, each country is different, and that we're finding then you have to solve it at really the country level first. We then start looking at it from a regional. And to your point, sorry, I'll just squeeze this in. There's the, the global dialogue in this is phenomenal between WHO for health, FAO for food security, OIE for animal, and the World Bank. At least every assessment that I've been aware of, those partners have all had a representative on the joint external evaluation and been very active. And that's where the World Bank is trying to see where it can fit into the equation for funding those gaps. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, I just want to, it's slightly a bit of a highlighting thing, but I, I, I touched on it before. The, the Fleming Fund that the British government has already announced is in its, let's call it, infant stages. Uh, and one of the ideas that we encouraged that led to that starting was that you could get some very well-known uh, non-for-profit uh, organizations that, that, that are particularly interested in the interplay with infectious disease control, again, thinking about it in mm -hmm. TB in particular, but malaria, HIV as well, as, as helping develop those surveillance things develop on a, on a truly global scale. We, we actually, at one stage, were thinking of trying to estimate how much money would be needed just for global surveillance, and we sort of backed off a bit from that at the end, but I think there are some initiatives underway. The second thing that the British government has also uh, announced, and it's even more in an infant stage, is a so-called Ross Fund. Uh, which could is is linked to other forms of, uh, of 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 support for specifically efforts in the infectious disease area, but possibly also interplaying with uh, diagnostic technology. So, you know, that's just what the UK has done past year, um, mm -hmm. partnering with others and getting getting some of these organisations and other countries involved together. I, I said on the innovation fund, we're piloting this thing with China and. There's so much going on there, and there is in everything. But who know, who knows where where that could go? Uh, what one could think of a number of uh, enlightened countries coming together to specifically actively cooperate for things in this world, just in Africa, for mm -hmm. example. Mm -hmm. I mean, I guess I wonder whether, um, for example, we could give we could have some funding conditional on improvements in the GHSA score, right? So, because one thing is to say, okay, well, I need to buy <coughs> microscopes. I don't know what it is. You know, the, the supplies for a lab. I would do input-based finding, which is what's going to come out of those assessment reports. But should we think about trying to create some financial and reputational incentives to move that score up? I think, it's a, I yeah. think that, that sounds like a very interesting uh, idea to me. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm sort of a slightly weird thing to throw in. A country that uh, throughout my professional life I, I've been really intrigued by, and I often say it's arguably one of the most, if not the most interesting country in the world, is South Korea. Partly because it's the only country of more than 40 million people that's become wealthy from having the same, when I was very young, it had the same mm -hmm. income as an African country. And actually at an event we, had, we were involved in in New York, very, to, we didn't know that they were going to be there, but the South Koreans presented what they're doing in, in antimicrobial resistance. And I, to me, for many countries in the emerging world that have this aspiration, obviously, to get mm -hmm. to their kind of wealth, you've got to copy what these guys, aspects of what these guys can do. And, and so linking it to mm -hmm. achievement and, and kind of aspects yeah. of paper performance make, makes an enormous amount of sense to me. It sounds intuitively a really sensible thing to do. Great, we'll implement that after this. <laughs> Thanks. Make it happen. I mean, can I ask another question about Gavi? I mean, uh, so the Gavi model is a really interesting one. 
um, both as a place to create advanced market commitments and as a place to scale up access to vaccines. But middle incomes are not part of that scheme. That's been some discussion in the global health world. Should there be like a tier price for middle incomes through a Gavi Plus? I mean, if we really want to scale up um, vaccination coverage or access to new vaccines that might come on the market? I mean, I, I can see that in, in, in ag, mm -hmm. in agriculture in the low income world. Yeah. Why, why would you not? Yeah, I don't, I, I don't know how to answer on the human side. On the agriculture side, it's a little bit, it, it's actually more complex. I mean, of the at least 18 pathogens about which we're wor worried, only four of them are zoonotic from the standpoint that you actually find them in an animal species, most likely transmitted to humans through a food source. So there are only four. Mm -hmm. Of those, only one has a vaccine at this time. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and, and salmonella, there are so many species of salmonella that it's only effective against certain ones. So right now, technologically, we're not mm -hmm. quite there yet. Mm -hmm. And so there would have to be a lot of innovation to go on, but we need to spur that innovation. Mm -hmm. and, and so you know, that's part of the, the whole cycle that has been highlighted and is in yeah, part, part of why I say things like that, and it goes back to the core of how we have tried to approach our idea generation is, Everybody's got to get out of the comfort zone and you've got to do things to encourage things that should be happening that aren't happening. And unless you think of ways to encourage more vaccines, then of course you don't have them right now, but we need to have them. Uh, one of the reasons, very understandably, why so many antibiotics are used in agriculture is because of the fact we don't have the vaccines, mm -hmm. I guess. Mm -hmm. I don't know, but I'm guessing that's why. So we need to do things to stimulate them. Mm -hmm. Or Gabby for animal health. Right, right. But I, I think uh, nod, nod of the head there from my uh, my ag specialist. Yeah, we like that okay, idea. Okay, great. We'll go ahead with that. Write that one down. Um, you mentioned getting out of our comfort zone. Uh, your tenth recommendation is to create great ba greater, build a global coalition for real action via the G20 in the UN. Mm -hmm. um, how do you want the G20 to get out of its comfort zone in September? So uh, you guys have already helped a little bit in that regard, uh, and I watched a little bit of it on, on, from my office. That, so um, one, of, one of the intriguing, many intriguing dilemmas about this uh, is that, as I said, I now sit as a minister in a finance ministry. And despite that fact, when I try to engage with other finance ministries around the world, how we need to sort this out, they're like, isn't that what you should be talking to people in health about? Mm -hmm. <laughs> like, mm -hmm. no, look at what I'm doing. Mm -hmm. uh, I, you know, I'm not a health person. And I say you guys have already contributed because you, you hosted that uh, side event which uh, my boss, George Osborne, mm -hmm. spoke at. Uh, and so we, we need to, and, and again, the more, I, I wouldn't have thought this way probably before two years ago, but uh, when you have all this focus in so many parts of the world on more infrastructure spending, isn't, isn't health, right? Part of health, in, isn't that infrastructure? Mm -hmm. uh, and, and especially in, 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 in helping some places think about this middle income trap, you know, again, mm -hmm. what do I know, but never stopped me before. Mm -hmm. um, when it comes to reasons why they don't get through it, health and education are probably two of the if not the biggest two. So the more that can be encouraged, and I love this mm -hmm. pay for performance thing, that's how you help them get through it. Mm -hmm. um, and the, and the, the, the sort of uh, macro uh, multiple, multiplier benefits that one could imagine that come through that would be significant, in my view. Mm -hmm. So what do you want the G20 to do? In September? I, I Let me ask you it in a different way, and I'll ask it to all of you before we move to open questions. In a year from now, or six months from now, what would success look like to you? So, uh, the, so first of all, the fact that the G20 in Ankara last year actually mentioned antimicrobial resistance was uh, a positive surprise. When I was told a week or so before it that that was possible, I was like, nah, too, too soon. But it, it, it got on there. Uh, and it is... Not always the case, but quite often the case that once an issue gets onto the agenda of 
G20, G, G20 policymakers, it doesn't come off until it stopped being an issue as to why it got on in the first place. So at a minimum, uh, I would want to see in this year's G20 more words than was on the Ankara one. <laughs> and you had to delve through the pages before you got to it, by the way. Uh, but as a minimum, that would be pretty good. What should those words but, say? But of more substance, uh, I, I would, I, my dream is that they announce an agreement about uh, some version of uh, a market entry reward, as we call it, uh, and how the money's going to be raised to get new drugs that work. Uh, and I think it's pretty hard to get all the details worked out, but there's, there's, there's discussions about that already taking place. If it's not happened by the end of the German G20, uh, so another 15 months, I would be, I would be very disappointed. We can, we can help with the details here, don't worry. There you go. <laughs> uh, Lawrence Kerr, what would success look like to you? So we've singled out the G20, but I think actually the dialogue over the past couple of years leading to first G7 a year ago, G7 this year, G20, slight mention last year, increased momentum this year, the G77 this year, and then ultimately leading to the UN General Assembly high-level meeting this year on the 21st of September. All of these are really taking the issue that has been in the health world for decades. There have been people <laughs> wagging the red flag for years, but it's now elevated it to where in September you will have heads of state that are coming together. And we talk about a momentous year for the culmination of trying to get this right. And that's the part about what will they say? that we're all working so diligently on to try and get the momentum so that there isn't just you know, a statement made and then nothing happens. Rather, there's a statement made and then it accelerates motion and action that can be followed up on. So you know, Lord O'Neill has highlighted exactly right. The, the ongoing dialogue with China right now in the G20 is that we firmly believe and support that this needs to be in the final statement. And that in addition to that, to go further and actually talk about what are options for economic incentives that should be explored and to return. Because the thing is, the G7, the developing countries talking to themselves is one thing. The G20 talking among all the partner nations is a totally different beast. And the G77 is even different. So you know, I, I see it as just this wave of momentum where we have opportunities to bring more and more believers in to spur action. Amanda. Well, I'm not as hopeful, I have to say, about the, uh, the UN, G20, and you're other not, kinds uh, of international groups. Today, but <laughs> maybe I should drink more coffee. Um, so I think, I hope, I hope that those high level meetings really do trigger action, but I, I would like to see some very concrete. Um, financial commitments and economic incentives set up so that we can have kind of a race to the top. And I, I like the idea of pay for progress, not because I think it will 100% work in every case. I think it needs to be tested. But, but I want to be able to say at the end of another year, we've made progress on AMR. And how do I know? Because I can say it's, this is happening in such and such a country. Mm -hmm. And I hope it's not about you know, things I bought and labs built, because that is, that's a worry that I have, that we're just very focused on our input-based investments and not on the result that we want to see at the end of the day. But, th but given how long it takes to bring new drugs to market, how would you show yeah. impact? How would you show that outcome in the Well, year? I mean, there are these different prize ideas. Um, you know, there's a big prize at market entry, or there's little prizes along the way. So I think, you know, there are ways to reward progress and give signs of progress. Um, that we'd have to look at in more detail, of course. But you know, we, I think we want to be able to say to the world in a year or two, here are some concrete ways that, that we've gone forward. Um, so, so uh, yeah. I'd, I'd, my, the only thing I find my mind thinking when I hear that, in it, so in addition to somewhere between the modest hope I have and the, the really great hope, I think it would also be quite helpful for those countries that themselves want to action further their own domestic action plan to actually do it 
at the time of when these events are taking place to highlight that there's stuff going on in important places. Um, like a pledging session or something like that. You know, cousin off, yeah. But, but serious yeah. action plans. Yeah. I mean, we talked about the idea of the open government partnership uh, in some other context, which is, you know, a series of governance reforms and a commitment to openness and transparency in governance. And they do a little bit what we're talking about with the global health security agenda. They benchmark each other. Mm -hmm. um, you know, is that the way to go, a club where we're trying to uh, show progress on some of these key measures going forward? I, I think the WHO is sort of tiptoed for, for well, yeah. it's not sufficient because, of course, this is, crosses so many areas, but mm -hmm. WHO from, has kind of done that. It's tiptoeing mm -hmm. down that path, which is, a, in my view, uh, a welcome thing that needs, that I'm happy to encourage more. The other side to showing progress to me, I, I, I've always got, I guess, you know, a symbol of a coin in the back of my mind in that on one side of the coin, we as individuals, nations, and then the world have to preserve the existing antibiotics that we have. If, if, we, if we allow their continued decline and create more bacteria that are resistant, then the scales that have been shown on the graphs earlier will accelerate even faster. Mm -hmm. The other side of the coin, where you have the incredibly large investments that are needed to change the market incentives for producing the new lines of antimicrobials and antibiotics, is a different beast. And so looking at these two both individually, there are things that can be done in the national level that yeah. are right. actually cheap. I mean, stewardship programs are really predominantly education, oversight, and just continually putting those practices in place, day-to-day -day infection prevention and control. The other side where you are talking about spurring innovation is where we need the high-level dialogues to go on and then the commitment from the partners that are able to fund those efforts. Mm. Well, I mean, I think cheap means something different in our U.S. health system where we're spending, what, 18% of GDP versus cheap in a low- and middle-income country where, you know, it, having, you know, d increasing infection prevention and control in healthcare facilities is an effort that has not necessarily gotten underway, right? Mm -hmm. So you're building a whole infrastructure or quality in prescribing or reducing over-the-counter prescription or lack of adherence. So I think... Maybe we shouldn't think that, I, I agree with you that the order of magnitude of the resources that are required to spur innovation and research and development are significant and require global action, but I also think there's global action needed to support uh, low and middle income countries to move forward on those domestic programs mm -hmm. that, that do have a, a pretty significant cost for those systems. But we even have to look to our own selves. Domestically, 90% mm -hmm. of our hospitals don't have antibiotic stewardship programs. Yeah. And so how are we spurring yeah. those? We're using CMS's ability to yeah. use um, conditions of uh, participation yeah. in order to drive those. Exactly, exactly. And so, you know, mm -hmm. here we, we, we have to be careful about how we preach to other countries oh, and are yeah, always sure. cautious about that mm -hmm. when we don't necessarily have our own house in order. But I take your point. It's something yeah. that when you are looking at a country um, there are some practices, at least in IPC, that, that truly are just training, maintenance, exercise, mm -hmm. and repetition so that they can become part of the normal. And those definitely you know, can contribute to the overall decrease infection burden. Um, I'm counter to Amanda here, but thinking my optimistic, why not explore? <coughs> so picking up on what you've just said, in addition to, uh, and, the, and the G20 meeting and the high level agreement, by the way, are gonna be uh, 15 calendar days apart. So from the start, from the G20 through to the UN, what would be, it would be great if the US uh, were to announce at that time, some new steps to do, to do better than what you've just said. Uh, I'm saying that partly because it's not got a lot of attention, but the, in the UK, the British Prime Minister has responded already in part to our proposals and said they're gonna uh, actually adopt our recommendations for the agri agricultural target to reduce hospital-based infections, including E. coli, mm -hmm. by up to 50%, which is a something wow. Uh, so if you had other countries, very important countries like the US, doing something like that, 
and, and linked to what you're saying, if you could mm -hmm. find an important low-income country that would, would agree to embark on it, and the World Bank does aspects mm -hmm. of what you're saying, here's, an here, here's how we're going to put into place with one place right now. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, it requires people to think a little bit out of the box, but with some of the challenges that are going on, in very, uh, that doesn't strike me as that difficult to do. <laughs> okay, on that note, Let's open up to questions from the audience. We have a couple of people with microphones going round. Uh, what I'm going to ask you to do is, if you have a question and the microphone comes to you, uh, stand up, say your name, your affiliation, and then I'm going to encourage you to keep any statements very brief <laughs> and move directly to a question. Uh, so let's go first to Charles in the corner, and then I'll take three questions at once. Let's get this gentleman here, and then let's get this lady here. Thanks very much. Um, I'm Charles Kenny. I'm here at the, the centre and I'm actually thinking uh, um, uh, with a, a group here about uh, demand side approaches and how to reduce demand for uh, AMR and the international role for that. So I'm hoping your answer to my question is no. Um, my question is, should we really be caring about the demand side? And when you hear what Amanda says about um, the, the sort of the quality of diagnosis in, in India, when you look at the Look, baby steps, especially first baby steps, are always important. But if you look at the teeny baby steps that the Obama administration was managed to, managed to take on the issue of, of um, agricultural use of uh, antimicrobials over the last few years, you know, by the time we really do something serious on, on, on the demand side, it'll be 2035 and we'll have more deaths from uh, uh, you know, microbial resistance from cancer. Do we really have time to fuff around with this stuff, or should we just be chucking a lot of money at the supply side? Okay, thanks, Charles. Charles has a book coming out later this year, we hope, <laughs> The History of Infectious Diseases. Just a... There you go for the plug. Okay, uh, this, this gentleman <laughs> next. So, Zihan from GSK. Um, so, Lord O'Neill, thank you for your leadership and uh, your team's leadership in addressing the AMR. So I think there's a lot of focus talk about the G7 and G20, and we all know there's two countries that are particularly critical for this you know, global action plan, that's China and India. In your conversation with leaders from those countries, in thinking about the, sh the quick wins and short-term successes, what are the kind of things they can bring to the table uh, that can quickly uh, help us to activate the glo global action plan against AMR? Okay. Thank you. And then this lady. Hi, Caitlin Ashes um, with Becton Dickinson. I'm, I'm health economist with the diagnostic division. So my, my question comes from the industry side. There's a lot of talk about you know, new diagnostics and better, more rapid um, uh, diagnostics and, and, and antibiotics. But you know, how can we create better access to or optimize what we already have in terms of diagnostics and, and um, antibiotics? And how can industry help in this global dialogue to create concrete steps, shelving you know, development. I think we're going to do that. We have to do that to succeed. But um, in terms of more practical steps, either for stewardship or, or other ideas where industry can kind of be a partner in all these conversations. I have a feeling we should probably ask the man from the industry that question, <laughs> actually. Um, but let's start with Charles's question. Um, should you really care about the demand side, given the, the, the incremental pace at which we can reduce demand? So I mean, no, I know that five and a half thought, year recommendations. I thought about Charles demand. said, did, uh, I think you tried to say you were hoping we would say no. Oh. Yes, we should care about the demand. Oh right, I mean, <laughs> in my opinion, as I, I didn't elaborate, but I think it's more important than the supply side, uh, because if we deal with the demand side, we can solve this problem permanently. If we get new drugs. It'll solve it for a generation, but we're going to develop resistance to new drugs. Um, whereas if we stop treating them like sweets, we stop treating them like sweets. Um, so of course, um, whatever, whatever steps all of you here can do to encourage the US to be a bit bolder, I think would be rather good. Uh, but I think it's enormously important uh, in, in all the ways that we've tried to make clear. Others, Larry? I, I can't imagine other than no. <laughs> to your, uh, and so that's why, you know, when I, when I was hearing it, because again, it, it, it's, a, it, it's a handshake between the two that ultimately occurs. And that if you have the individuals that are 
hopefully prescribing and agree that we almost have to separate the dialogue then between the human and the agriculture side to have that conversation, that on the human side, it's a much more tractable measure for us to address who are the users and then who are the providers. The tricky thing for us in the US is that for decades, we haven't really known who the users are and we certainly don't have an appreciation of the way in which antibiotics are used simply because by our regulatory systems they've never been measured. And so we don't know the amount of antibiotics that go into the variety of feed um, across the different sectors. And so you almost have to then break the individual sectors down between aqua, poultry, porcine, and bovine. So you know, when you tease each one of those out, and I will say that yes, we have taken, we, the US government has taken a totally different approach to the regulatory system than our partners in Europe and the, the EU, in that it has been a voluntary partnership with first the industry to change their labeling so that growth promotion is no longer allowed. The industry, all 27 manufacturers, changed before the deadline by voluntary admission. And that there has been a reduction seen and that the overall implementation of the veterinary feed directive is designed to get at the base of the problem that we don't actually know how much antibiotics are used in overall feed system. So again, we're now almost trying to step back in time and put systems in place for surveillance to understand how much antibiotics are used and for what purpose, mm -hmm. so that then we can actually set, well, this may not be bi biologically or medically or veterinarily, veterinary? Ad <laughs> under veterinary advice, the best dose that is needed. And so, you know, we're trying to base everything upon th the evidence that we have, and we're working towards Sorry, that. Sorry, Amanda, just mm -hmm. one, one other quick thing I meant to mention that one of, one of the uh, really encouraging things that has happened since we started is this, I, I, I call it the Shake Shack factor, mm. that the emergence of Shake Shack, and it may be for other reasons, that big US food producers sort of dining out on, on not having antibiotic fed chicken, that's like a really important thing in my opinion. And mm. that's amongst the, an, another angle to the whole awareness campaign that uh, and that, 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 you know, these things are important when consumers start to act. And I, I think this is probably, if it's carrying on with the way it's going, that's going to pressurize US policymakers into doing more than perhaps otherwise they may do. I'm actually quite hopeful, given, given what some of the things I hear from younger people in China, that, that, you know, something like that I wouldn't dismiss as being that far down the road in China too. Let's pick up on the second question from the man from GSK. Uh, let's ask you this, uh, Lord O'Neill. Uh, what can please, China's please and in China Jim, and India's way. lead? Sorry. Please call me Jim. I kind of cringe every time I hear that, Lord O'Neill. <laughs> okay, your your reminds holiness, me of your the holiness, hours Jim. I have to sit in there <laughs> voting. <laughs> <laughs> I'm um, away from that for a week. It's nice. <laughs> All right, Jimbo. Now, <laughs> um, what can the That's leaders right. of China and India bring to the table that can help activate a global action plan? So that's a, it's a great tough but really important question. Um, I could talk for hours about it, but to be specific, again, China is hosting this G20. And uh, I have to be careful how I articulate this because I know it's all going live and being recorded. Mm -hmm. But if it doesn't get m much of an, a mention uh, in view of all the efforts that are being made, that said something about the host, in my opinion. Uh, and I think China, as, uh, as, as uh, I've spent a lot of time talking to them about it, uh, and I think they have an important role to play. One of the things that I f figured out straight away when I was asked, when I was told how long I should be expected to spend on it, was realizing this year was going to be the Chinese G20. The G20 was created to give the BRICS a voice in global policy, don't come much bigger than this. You say you spent a long time talking to the Chinese. Are they receptive? What have they said? Uh, that you I have some back? encouragement that they're going to they're going to 
preside over more being said than was said in Ankara. Let's just say that. <laughs> okay. Uh, others want to uh, uh, jump in on this question about what you hope. No, oh, let's move to the third question then. Um, how can we optimize the diagnostics that we already have? Well, there's a second part to your question about industry as well, wasn't there? <coughs> What would you like to see, Larry, maybe Amanda as well? And I might actually ask you on this question as well. So I think there's already a robust dialogue ongoing with industry because while governments can make suggestions, governments ultimately don't do the advanced development, manufacturing, and production of any of the products, whether it be diagnose, any of the medical countermeasures writ large. Mm -hmm. And so this, when we talk about a partnership, we truly do mean that because we need to understand what are the incentives that are going to actually bring the biotech and pharmaceutical sectors that traditionally have not been in the market or have decided to decrease their investments in uh, anti antibiotic research or new diagnostic companies to bring in their expertise. Because I will say from a government perspective I often think of it that we're not necessarily on the cutting edge. Whereas the industry is, what is the art of the possible in terms of bringing a rapid diagnostic that is, you know, everybody's dream, cheap, ideal, sensitive, and specific to, you know, a provider somewhere in the world? Uh, we, we don't know that, but, you know, the UK's Longitudinal Prize and then the NIH's Diagnostic Prize on, in AMR are very tightly coordinated and are working with the industry to understand what those requirements are and actually what is the art of the possible within a three to five year time frame to get the diagnostics, for example, that would tell the difference between a bacterial and a viral infection out into the marketplace. Mm. Amanda? I mean, one big issue with these kinds of prizes is determining their size. And obviously that's been a topic uh, that you have thought about. And I think you know, what, what is the size of the prize that makes the business case feasible? And it's hard to know what that is because we don't actually have the greatest economics hmm. from outside industry on what the requirements are. And maybe the inside industry has that <coughs> number, but is there a way that we could get a better handle on this in a way that we all felt was fair that would be hmm. useful? And then with diagnostics, I'm price point for diagnostic for low and middle income countries, right? So one thing is obviously it would have a business case in high income markets, but then would there be like a tiered price for the rest of the world? How, how would we handle that? So I, on, uh, I'm, I'm straight, I'm going to end up straying into territory that Amanda said we would have an, know, a, a, an afternoon yeah, free of no. here. But, <laughs> um, just on the sides, the, the, uh, there is a, a, another well-known NGO that has been a little bit vocally <laughs> critical of us, of the number, mm -hmm. saying it, it doesn't cost that much. And our answer to that is, well, go ahead and you produce it and show that that's the case, because that in itself would be pretty important mm -hmm. if, that, if that's the case, because, you know, yeah. we've said that number based on collection of an enormous amount of intelligence from the whole, whole of the pharmaceutical world. And so somebody thinks that's bigger than is justifiable. That sounds like an opportunity for, mm -hmm. <laughs> for them. Um, on on the, uh, the broader issue of your question, uh, I've got two parts of answering that. So one, as I said earlier, one, one of the powerful things that I think policymakers can do, and again I cite what already the British response to us has been, is, is to show that they're serious as a policy priority. They're going to cut the amount of uh, antibiotics that are being used. And if it's a tough target, they're going to have to use different things in order to get to them, i.e. diagnostics, which should be uh, a stimulant to existing diagnostics providers. And most importantly, most importantly, in my <laughs> opinion, open up the whole market to other brilliant technology providers that kind of sniff around about what's going on there, think, you know what, now it's time for, for us to get to you know, Amazon or I don't know, mm. who knows. Um, on the broader thing, um, there was a remarkable thing that uh, 
happened in, in, in Davos. It's now called the, the Davos Declaration, in which uh, the industry <coughs> s uh, s had its own collective statement as to what it believed was necessary. Mm -hmm. And I th it was 85, I think it was, Halla, that signed up uh, initially, and it's, it's still being added to. There's now 105 of the, these guys that have put pen to paper, uh, which was a... If somebody would have said to me two months before that that you would have got any more than three mm -hmm. of the big pharma guys to sign up that, I would have said no chance, but they have, which shows there's, there's something going on. Uh, as I said to a number of them yesterday, and I'll say to it here, I think we need Davos Declaration 2 as to what now following everything we're saying and hearing some of the noises going from policymakers, what is it that the industry wants to materially bring to the table as to is to, is to going to take their involvement to the next stage. I'd actually really like to get your idea of this if I can, Jen. If you can get a mic down here, <coughs> just um, what would incentivise the industry to create new antibiotics to tackle this problem rather than I don't know another allergy medicine. You know, for, from the diagnostic perspective. Yeah. Right. So I, I think you know obviously uh, the. The diagnostic is very important in terms to support the proper use of antibiotic. But as a drug developer, I think it's, it's incredibly important. So there's three things that I perhaps want to highlight you know, in relation to answer your question. I think at least at the population level, it's important if you have a good diagnostic, we'll know what the problems are. So then we can, when we develop drugs, we, we know which hospital we're gonna go to or which country we're gonna go to. So those are very, very important. The surveillance program, backed by a very sophisticated diagnostic uh, device will be very important. I think the other thing is that it's, it's going to help us to be more efficient in developing uh, antibiotics because then we can quickly identify patient with the right bug or right, right resistant phenotype that we can uh, treat them and, 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 and then so without wasting a lot of money on, on, on patients who actually don't have the, the specific type of bug and, and resistance that we want. I think the third thing that I want to comment on, I think is, is I think we have started doing some of this, like the, the pharma and the diagnostic companies start talking to each other. I think we should do more of that, creating a more open you know, partnership. I think we've done some of that two years ago, a few of us working together and, and, and partner with a, a diagnostic company, try to support them to develop their diagnostic methodologies. I think, I think we should do more of that because that, that, that that communication between the diagnostic manufacturer and the drug manufacturer, if we can sit together and then design the type of need, that will be very, very important. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks very much. Let's get a couple more questions. I know Kim Elliott over there had a question, and then gentlemen over here. And then if we have time, this lady over here. We'll take the question. We'll see if we get time to answer it. Uh, thanks, Kim Elliott with CGD, and I um, wanted to follow up on the, the, the livestock question. Um, starting with Mr. Kerr, is there any chance at all that the U.S. would be willing to even talk about the global target that's recommended in the O'Neill review? Um, and to Mr. O'Neill, um, uh, sort of what are you hearing from China, India, and other developing countries, and is this something that they would be willing to sign on to, or is it going to take some both carrots and sticks, as we had in the Montreal Protocol, which you raised in your report as a potential sort of model for this kind of an a, international agreement. Um, it had both sanctions against non-parties as well as uh, provisions for technical assistance um, and financial assistance. And then for Amanda, <coughs> the, the report also talks about you know, setting this global target and then letting countries figure out the best way to achieve it in their context. So that seems made for COD8 or paper mm -hmm. results. But the first thing that then comes to my mind is from our forest team, you know, how do we prevent the aidification of that kind of a scheme, a la the red plus for forests? Do you know you can talk to Amanda any day of the week? She's just <laughs> down, <laughs> down the <laughs> corridor from you. We can talk. <laughs> uh, gentleman with the blue tie. Hello, I'm uh, Tim Rutten. I'm with DSM Sinecam Pharmaceuticals. Uh, we are one like, of the largest uh, producers of uh, sustainable antibiotics in the world. Which company? Uh, DSM Sinecam Pharmaceuticals. Um, one of the topics which was raised in the AMR review is the role of pharmaceutical pollution in the emergence of uh, AMR, especially also in the developing world, because a large part of the pharmaceuticals is actually produced in that area of the world. Um, as these are some Sinecam Pharmaceuticals, we are pushing uh, for the industry to step up themselves, and also relating to the uh, 
uh, remarks just made by, uh, by Lord O'Neill, Jim. Um, what do you see as the potential of the industry setting the bar itself and trying to raise it, maybe by an industry label? That's one of the things that could be in Davos Declaration too. Yeah. Easy to answer that one. Yeah. Okay, we've answered that one already. Let's get the question from the lady at the back there. <laughs> Hi, um, this one? Yeah. yeah. Um, I'm Olga Jonas, I'm from the World Bank. And uh, thank you very much for this latest report. Because um, we are also working on an AMR report ourselves. Um, isn't what um, you, you are, um, we are sort of struggling to um, seize now is a um, um, reversal of low priority to public health systems over decades and, and chronically so mm -hmm. in not just in developing, especially in developing countries, but also in developed countries. Um, low prioritization by the governments because you know there's no accountability and somehow they don't see these two, two and a half thousand percent rates of return <laughs> that um, you know we know are there, but you know nobody and they doesn't seem to be believed. And also low prioritization on the donor side. And uh, there is now a danger that mm -hmm. this will, you know, the, the, the reform efforts that we are discussing will, may not be sustained. And um, that actually this may be the last opportunity to, um, to change the structure of the incentives mm -hmm. in the whole system, in the way the aid agencies approach it, the multilateral agencies approach it, um, so that there would be a um, more permanent and, I mean, a permanent, more appropriate um, system of incentives. And um, Amanda talked about, you know, the World Bank, and indeed the World Bank is mainly for assistance to countries. If there's no demand from countries, you know, public health is not being funded, and that's been the history mm -hmm. um, in, the, in this sector. Um, but we do have a precedent for giving bonuses from IDA. The IDA is the biggest fund, um, $50 billion for three years, that's mobilized very ably by, by the World Bank. And there, countries get bonuses for regional projects, mm -hmm. recognizing the cross-border spillovers. And this is very much you know, the, the issue here, because AMR <coughs> is a global, I mean, it has, has cross-border. Uh, implications. So, wouldn't it, this be a time to, do, you know, to say that public health systems, bank projects financing these, um, are all eligible for this bonus? Mm -hmm. That's, you know, it's an established practice with, within um, the IDA um, replenishment to give more money for um, projects that are in the global interest as well as in the national interest. Mm -hmm. So, that's wanted. just one idea to, you know, to change the incentive in a way that will last. Mm -hmm. Why don't you pick up on that point, Amanda? Yeah, well, I was, I'm very inspired by your work, Olga, as you will have seen from the introduction. Um, but yeah, I think that's a great idea. I, I think any, any kind of uh, plus that you would get from Ida, I mean, you could even think of, you know, if you had a, we talk about soft earmarks on Ida associated with some kinds of trust funds, you know, that would encourage more use of Ida for, for certain um, uses. <coughs> Certainly that would be better to do for global public goods than it would for uh, some other kinds of uses. So I think it's a really good idea. And I mean, I hope, I really hope that the AMR review uses its voice to talk about the specific things you'd like to see bilateral and multilateral agencies do. Um, because they do have a lot of tools, uh, and I think it's, a, it's an opportunity, as you say, a window of opportunity to really put some very concrete things down. And it's an area where, you know, you as a sitting in the, the Department of Treasury have eyes on what's happening as well. Hmm. And let's get some responses to Kim's yeah. Yeah, uh, Kim. questions. Yeah. Uh, Larry, first to you. Is there any chance of the yeah. U.S. talking about the targets mentioned in the AMR review for antibiotics in livestock? So I can answer your question easier than I can answer hers. Is there any I chance was just paraphrasing that we will question. talk about? The answer is yes, the dialogue will be had. Is there Do we think in, in concert with the industry that we can meet those? No. Mm -hmm. And it's, an inter so it's a fascinating dialogue, and I try to explain it to people from the standpoint. If you think about a physician is treating the patient in front of them, 
a public health person is treating a population, <laughs> i.e., I want 80% of you to be vaccinated in order to create herd immunity. Mm -hmm. As a veterinarian that is looking over a 500,000 head <coughs> set of cattle, they're trying to think about what is going to keep the entire herd safe. Remove growth promotion from the equation. How do you use antibiotics and medicines in order to create an environment where those herd, that herd will survive and create a, food, a safe and sustainable food supply? That is the difficult conversation that is had to know when you need to begin to bring down the levels. And so, for example, I think one of the things that I'm taking away from this conversation is how would one have a Davos declaration among the uh, manufacturers that produce veterinary antibiotics yes. and antimicrobials to tell basically governments what they think the art of the possible is for their consumers, mm -hmm. which are the, predominantly the feed industry. And that's something that, you know, we, we simply are, we would love to be able to try and get to those targets. It's just that we are being told right now, predominantly, again, I'm going to speak for the pig and the beef industry. Chicken, you are finding that the market is driving a very high percentage of them to go antibiotic free. And it is the changes within the Subways, the McDonald's, the mm -hmm. Paneras, you know, across the board that are actually driving the suppliers to then produce antibiotic-free poultry. Jim, so question Mark, about China and India. On, on this topic. On livestock. Yeah, antibiotics uh, and livestock. What are they, uh, what are they saying to I, you? I, I can't. I, so the first thing to say in the context of what I just heard, the occasionally some people try to make analogies with climate change with the whole AMR challenge and what our reviewers face and I think there are many areas where it's just not at all sensible to do that. In terms of aspects of the ag thing and the interplay between the, the you know the north south stuff it is it is it is very unlikely that uh, emerging countries particularly large agricultural producers uh, will will sign up to the principle of targets if the US won't and notwithstanding the very important points you just said those those challenges are even bigger in a lot of those uh, emerging countries certainly including those two but India in particular I, I, w I would hazard a guess and so uh, I personally think the US should be more ambitious uh, I think to the principle and, and, and our specific recommendation has taken into account these kind of genuine realities and why we're talking about a target beginning in 2018 phased in over 10 years. Because the same thing with why we're suggesting mandatory uh, targets in 2020 for diagnostics for human prescription. If you don't have something like that, it doesn't that's a real signal from policymakers to diagnostic developers. Uh, the Dav as I said a minute ago, the, da the Davos declaration that the farmer industry gave in January on, on one level was fantastic. But it, uh, you know, a skeptic would say, well, it's just a description as to what, what they'd be prepared to get out of bed for if other things that they didn't mm -hmm. put down on the paper you know, were to happen. But so policymakers have got to play their own response in, in being more serious about the issues to encourage these private market people to take the risk. Mm -hmm. uh, and I, I think if the US, and, and this is partly going back to what we touched on earlier, the you know, what, what, would, what should be the UN high level agreement, I think the principle is more important than you know, saying we're all going to do these targets because it's not realistic for the reasons you're saying. But the principle is really important because it's important there are some um, in the conversations we've had with important global uh, participants, including the entity which is responsible for food things. Surprise, surprise, uh, I'm taking a risk and saying it, but we were not discouraged from suggesting a, uh, the notion of targets. I know you're and that's because they're thinking about the emerging world. I know you're speaking at an event on Capitol Hill tomorrow. So it'll be interesting to hear what your yeah. reception you get for that. But <laughs> let me that just conversation quickly, again we're running out of time, week. so I just want to get uh, an answer from you on Kim's other question about, uh, you know, you said that 
ch you're talking to the Chinese, mm -hmm. uh, and generally you seem to be getting positive soundings from them about their willingness to take action or lead at the G20. But what are China and India saying about antibiotics in livestock? That was Kim's question. I think they, fi uh, they find it trickier. If, uh, the, 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 the problems that you highlighted here, multiple levels, multiple levels more uh, complicated for them. So they, they find it trickier. But they're, they're not dismissive of the, the concept. Uh, you know, as I'm sure anybody here that follows China closely, you know, the whole environmental thing is a massive, massive issue, which particularly for the younger generation, I can't remember the name, this famous YouTube thing that had 300 million, they, we, were like, we do not want any more of that. And so it's their version of the global consumer, of the US food, you know, the pressure's coming from the consumer. We do not want these in, this, this scary growth environmental damage. And as one of you mentioned in this regard, linked to what you're pr promoting, that's a pretty big issue coming from AMR pollution in, in these places. And so there's pressure. Uh, so, you know, policymakers respond to pressures. Mm -hmm. uh, so I, 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 they have enormous issues. So having to sign up to implementing targets tomorrow, no. But the principle, no. But it's important that the biggest place in the free world signs up. Okay, we're going to have to leave it there. We're out of time. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, please thank our panellists for this discussion today. Thank you. Thank you.